This is a very quiet group. I hope you won't be <laughs> quiet the whole time. And uh, maybe you're busy eating, and I'm glad to see that. So please continue to help yourself as the uh, talk goes ahead with Roger's permission. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Roger Brooks uh, with us today, who is the CEO of uh, Facing History and Ourselves. I always get those words uh, confused. I turn them around in all kinds of... Uh, uh, facing order. Ourselves and History. Yes, I mean, there are many uh, potential ways that we could face ourselves and, and history. Um, Roger is a Brown PhD, and you may talk a little bit about that. Roger has a, a, an interesting history uh, as far as your relationship with higher ed. And I'll just uh, say what I uh, have read about you, and I hope that you will help us know more about you uh, during your talk. But uh, you had a long career at Connecticut College. Uh, Roger was a professor of Judaic studies. And then he began rising in the ranks. He was an associate dean of the faculty, a dean of the faculty, and eventually the chief academic officer. And now a I'm not CEO. sure that I'm not sure that's rising. <laughs> <laughs> well, ask, ask the faculty in the room; they might say. <laughs> we we are very pleased that you're here, Roger. And I just want to say that this is the uh, second or third event. Uh, of a set of events this spring that are focusing on the Holocaust and the aftermath. Uh, we have two more events, uh, two in April. One uh, will be by Omar Batov, uh, who is a, a fa Brown faculty member. And then the last one will be by Adam Teller, who is also a faculty member in Judaic Studies. We're very pleased that you're here today, Roger. Thank you, and Harry. look forward to your talk. Thank, thank you very much, Harry. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, it really is a delight to return to Brown. Um, I want to begin by uh, talking to you about one of the great Talmudists of the American study of the Talmud in the 20th century and now even into the 21st. His name is David Weiss Halivni, and he wrote the story of his life in a volume titled The Book and the Sword. Um, I just want to paraphrase the opening of his very last chapter. So here's what he says. It must have been with tongue in cheek that the great second century sage of the land of Israel, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, said, four things the Holy One, blessed be he, detests, and I don't like them either. Um, Halivni goes on to say that he would say exactly the same thing in all seriousness in connection to the Holocaust. He goes on, here's one of the four that I reject with derision merely asking the question, why was there a Holocaust? For this implies that there is an answer, and a just answer. But there are certain times, he says, in history when justification smacks of participation. A justification by definition means it should have happened. It's justice. It's the fitting course of events. Whatever the suggested answer to why might be, how Livni ends, it will inevitably relieve the murderers, at least partially, of their guilt. Okay. Now, none of us in this room want to uh, harm the cost pain to survivors or somehow impute uh, to them, uh, you know, that they participated or some way. None of us wants to relieve, uh, indict God uh, for, for the Holocaust, I think. Uh, but surely everyone in the room is here because we want to understand better the single most fundamental question you can ask about the Shoah. This question has been most recently asked by the scholar scholar of the Holocaust, a man named Peter Hayes. Uh, he's recently retired from Northwestern University. Uh, he's written books on I.G. Farben and their participation in the slave trade of Jews, uh, its role at, uh, at Auschwitz and Birkenau. Peter's recent book, which sums up his entire career of thinking, is titled, Why? Right, and he sets out to explain the Holocaust. So to put my own cards on the table, I fundamentally believe that the theologian in Halivni is right, that we dare not make excuses for the Holocaust, um, and that even asking the question of theological meaning may be worthy of derision. And 
I also equally fundamentally believe that Hayes, the historian, is right. That we have to ask the question of why, and further we have to press toward an answer to that question. Theology and history, which are two of my life's loves, are on a collision course, or at least they're on roads leading in different directions. That's the problem, right? So let me, let me back up slightly, about 25 years, uh, and introduce you to how I met Hayes and Halivni. I was teaching Jewish studies at the University of Notre Dame, which, by the way, is an interesting place to teach Jewish studies. Um, I became associated with a group called the Holocaust Education Foundation. And at the foundation's urging and owing to its generosity, a colleague and I spent a month at Yad Vashem studying in Israel, and then another three weeks traveling in Poland on our way back. We returned, and we team taught Notre Dame's first course on the Holocaust. Um, not long afterward, a group of about 40 professors, all of whom worked with the Holocaust Education Foundation, um, including Peter Hayes, uh, repeated that trip to Poland. And when we returned to the US, a group of us created something called the Summer Institute on the Holocaust and Jewish Civilization, which is run at, um, at Northwestern every year. Um, it's a seminar for scholars and advanced graduate students, helping them prepare to teach a course on the Holocaust. I've taught in the Summer Institute every year since then. Um, and, and remember that when the Summer Institute started in 1996, there really weren't very many places that were promoting the teaching of the Holocaust uh, at colleges and universities. Um, we offered sort of basic prep then, and the Institute has sort of morphed into a more of a high level kind of think tank for people who really want to think about how to teach this material um, PhD programs in the Holocaust are now available. They really wor weren't then. Well, Peter Hayes was the initial director of that institute, and he's always been aware, I think, of my belief that teaching about the Holocaust has to aim to help students um, not only factually but effectively, right? So the Holocaust, I think, has to have meaning beyond itself. Um, I learned that from my dissertation director right here at Brown, Jacob Neusner. Uh, may his memory be a blessing, he passed away this last year. Um, Jack often said that the entire point of the humanities is the making of generalizable meaning out of what initially appears to be particular, right? So for humanists, the Holocaust has to mean something beyond itself. Well, a year or two into the Institute's existence, while preparing for my teaching one of those summers, I came upon Halivni's book, which was first published in 1997. I was familiar with his work on the Talmud from my own research, um, but this book was something different. Uh, I still recommend it as a parallel uh, to Elie Wiesel's Night. Both men were born just a year apart in 1927, 1928. Both grew up in the same town in Romania, Siget. Both were uh, placed in confinement uh, ghettos set up in March of 1944, and then a few months later were deported to Auschwitz. Their stories diverged at that point, but their memories are really complementary, and their memoirs uh, are too, particularly in the way that Wiesel focuses night on the experience in the camps, and Halivni takes up what he calls a life of learning in the shadow of destruction. So these two go together really well, but the tension between their two ideas, Peter Hayes, Halivni, history, theology, has been building in my mind for the last 25 years. Um, so I want to say a few words about these two approaches uh, based on my experience as a faculty member who's taught about the Holocaust with undergraduates for, for a long time. When students are at the very beginning of their study of the Holocaust, I typically turn them away from history, at least for the first week or two. The Holocaust for them is so chronologically foreign. Remember, most of them were born, our freshmen this year were born in 99, I think, right? So things that happened in the middle of the century are, uh, are tough. Uh, it's geographically foreign. Many of them can show you on a map uh, they may even have visited all sorts of places, but few can find Vilna, right? Few can find um, Lublin. Uh, the Shoah is conceptually foreign to them as it is to most of us, right? I mean, the, the sheer 
horrors are impossible to imagine. So rather than fight the uphill battle of history, I prefer to begin with a unit on ethics or theology um, and usually turn to the viewpoint of the Jews who live this history, often based on texts from the responsa literature from within the camps. Uh, but it turns out that even in the most foundational Jewish texts in the Bible, um, there are books that directly address the questions of justification that Halivni detests. And I think it's worth uh, talking about two of them just for a moment. The book of Job, which uh, I hope is familiar, it's the book about uh, whether suffering is within God's plan. You may remember that Job's faith is tested by God, who allows him to suffer uh, every loss except his own life. And from our privileged place as readers of that story, we know about the deal struck between God and the adversary called Satan, right, in Hebrew. Uh, we know about that job, and, and so we have to, by definition, we have to reject the idea that Job is suffering nobly, right? He, it's not a noble thing. It's not a fair thing. Instead, we're invited, I think, as readers to an absolute knowing condemnation of a God who could engage in such an arrangement. How could God let that happen? And then at the end of the book, when God, out of the whirlwind, asks Job whether or not he was there. Were you there when I created the world, he says? And Job has to say no. He has to admit the impossibility of understanding. But we don't. As readers, we know exactly what happened. right? And I think the book allows us to have that, that moment where we say, Sometimes what God does is just not right. It feels to me like Halivni would want to deny what's obvious there, that this suffering, this egregious suffering, right, of Job's losing his children, losing his family, right, it feels to me like he'd want to say, deny the fact that that was actively allowed by God. And remember, God later makes it up by saying I, he gave Job more children and new children, right? The parallel to survivors who lost their families and then after the war built entirely new families um, is really, I think, too shocking um, to, not, to not pay attention to it. There's another book of the Bible worth thinking about for a moment. It's from just one week ago in the Jewish liturgy. Um, this is the, uh, the book of Esther. Right? Esther and her uncle Mordechai, you might remember, were assimilated Jews in Persia. Uh, they became aware of a planned uh, and state-sponsored annihilation of all the Jews everywhere. The text says in all 127 provinces of the king's land. The genocide that's planned was thwarted because Esther had risen to the level of queen and successfully petitioned the king for the life of her people. Now, it's interesting that God never appears as a character in that book, suggesting, I think, that redemption, if it's to come at all, will have to come from human resistance and human action. So the story of Esther challenges us, us to ask why the resistance to the Nazis wasn't more successful. There was resistance everywhere, right? In every place that there, there were Jews. But why weren't the Jews positioned within society to save one another as they had been in the past? In Halivni's terms, we'd be forced to wonder whether the victims were somehow complicit. And of course, Halivni won't ever count as that. So you see the questions that the Bible raises are indeed um, sort of difficult questions. So I'm going to leave aside two tantalizing details about the book of Esther. One is that when you write out a book of Esther in Hebrew, you can do it so that every, every column in the scroll begins with the word, the king. Um, the text allows that. And there are some who say that what that means is that, in fact, the king of kings, God, is actually behind the scene in the whole story. So it's a way of kind of saying this book that seems to be entirely about human action may in fact have divine uh, aspects to it. And the second piece I'd leave out is that um, the assimilation of the two main characters in that book are pretty extreme, right? So they're named Esther and, Mar and Mordechai. Esther is a cognate for Ishtar, right? 
Mordechai, a cognate for Marduk, and Ishtar and Marduk are two gods in the Middle East pantheon um, of all time. So the great heroes of that story, if you like, the particular Jewish story, are essentially named Christine and Christian, right? which are not common names for Jews today. Okay, I, I do think that um, students who ask about God's role in the Shoah are often trying on arguments of theodicy for the very first time. Um, and, and so many of them do at the age uh, when they're in college. Some of the questions are underdeveloped or awkward or even painful in their naivete because they're trying them on for the first time. And I imagine that it's questions such as those that are uh, what Halibni finds so hard to countenance, right? My own experience with those questions from my own students is that they're well-intentioned, authentic responses to the material. Um, they're not meant to cause pain or to indict God, but to inquire and shape lifelong attitudes about the problem of evil that is probably forming uh, in them for the first time. Um, and since I'm discussing the questions of undergraduates as I experience them, often their historical questions are also full of a certain level of naivete, or the questions are premature, at least. When Peter Hayes, after a lifetime of study and a career of painstaking historical creativity, asks why, there's something particularly moving and compelling about the question. I've been in teaching situations, however, where it felt like the, que the answer to the question why was, why don't you go study some more and learn some more, and then we can take up this question. Um, that question's not ready to yield to you yet, right? Um, why may be a question to which one is entitled uh, only after long and comprehensive engagement with a topic. Okay, so two years ago, I left academia, and I took up the presidency of Facing History in Ourselves, this, this organization that um, I, I've given my life to. Somewhere between Halivni and Hayes, my organization seeks to ask a third question, not of theology or history, but of something different altogether. So beyond the impossible question of was it just, or the incredible question of why, Facing History asks students to take up a question that balances what I think of as education and advocacy. Facing History asks students, so what? So let me explain what I mean by that. At Facing History, we combat bigotry through education. Racism, anti-Semitism, prejudice, stereotypes, all of these threaten our next generation at its very most vulnerable age of adolescence. So Facing History helps high school teachers create classrooms where students can learn to make ethical decisions, mo ask moral questions with courage and with compassion. Uh, we have an active network right now of more than 50,000 teachers. Um, we reach millions of students annually. And we have more than 140 studies that show that this, this is effective work. So uh, all of us in the room know that every day we see that democracy uh, can be fragile, right? Especially um, in the US right now. Uh, we hear reports of religious, ethnic, racial violence. Um, a recent nationwide survey done by the Southern Poverty Law Center showed that the 2016 presidential election had, and here I'm quoting, a profoundly negative impact on school children across the country, producing fear and anxiety, especially among children of color. That schools that have integrated social emotional learning and other pro-social curriculum into their classrooms have largely avoided those same problems. So educators, I think, are hungry for ways to address current events, contemporary issues, from a place of empathy, as well as academic rigor and critical inquiry, which research has shown all support better academic learning. Facing history is uh, considered best in class, I'm happy to say, uh, at offering this combination of social, emotional, and intellectual development. We leverage our uh, proven approach in order to help educators address complex and difficult topics um, at the core of what I think are national really important dialogues, including the rise of these hate groups, dangers of stereotyping, 
and the very fragility of democracy. Schools are a particularly important place. They have the uh, ability to both model and, and teach about civil society uh, by promoting respect and understanding. So how do we create teachers for a place like that? Our special sauce, if there is one, turns out to be a particular theory of learning that we support with uh, classroom resources and the like. Uh, our approach has three big pieces, uh, identity, history, and choices. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the three of them. Identity first. Students begin in a facing history class by mapping their own identity, and they see how similar they are in fact to others. Um, how many of you in the room know every person in the room? No, no one, right? But how many of you in the room um, think that you have something deeply similar to someone else in the room? Okay, most of you. What, do you, what, is, what is the thing you're thinking of? Collegial history, academic growth. Yeah. How about, and you're here at Brown? I mean, look, right, all those things. Great. So as you start mapping out who you are more and more, you start to realize that um, your ideas about human similarities and differences, race, religion, nation, these have greatly influenced the way that societies um, define membership in the last, I don't know, forever. And the answers to those questions can have really profound consequences because they define who does and who doesn't belong in your network of caring, right? Or, um, so from the very first moment that students are in a facing history classroom, they start to see fewer and fewer others as the other, and they start to see that what hel uh, sociologist Helen Fine calls the universe of obligation getting larger and larger. So identity. Students then undertake with us a rigorous study of a historical case. For instance, in the case of the Holocaust, the failure of Weimar democracy and all of the events that led through, through the events of the Holocaust. Um, we also have case studies on uh, civil rights in America, on uh, work in the Nanjing atrocities, um, religious intolerance in contemporary France. We're, we're doing a lot of other work, but no matter what the case study, facing history empowers these nascent moral philosophers, asking them to see universal questions within the details of history. So we're back to the humanities. Um, virtually every student at facing history, in a facing history course, will study at some point Raphael Lemkin's writings on genocide and learn how Lemkin's ideas allow drawing comparisons and contrasts between cases. So the Holocaust, the Armenian genocide, cultural genocide of indigenous peoples in Canada. Students can wrestle with these and other complex moments in human history, both as a set, but also, also in all of their particularity individually and without making kind of facile moral equivalencies. And third, we teach students how to analyze the choices that were available in history and the choices that were made. So successful facing history students learn that history was not inevitable, but was the result of people's behavior. To use our popular tagline, they learn that people make choices and that choices make history. I said before that it works, and I want to talk about that. We've done many assessments uh, to demonstrate that students who know that choices make history turn out to be better historians, um, more civically engaged with their peers, more likely to stand up when they see bullying. Uh, we ask these students how they'll choose to participate in their own society, and they're, because their choices are going to shape the history that their own children are going to live. We ask them, in other words, to ask the question, so what? Now many times the hope that we have for that question is that students will choose to be upstanders and not bystanders. An upstander is anyone who sees something happening that they know is wrong and walks over and tries to fix it. Um, intervening on behalf of a person who's been bullied, for example, or attacked. Two of our alumni, by the way, successfully petitioned the Oxford English Dictionary to add the word upstander. They were sort of upset that OED had added twerk and they thought, hey, if you can add twerk, you can add upstander. So they, they, they actually did that, and so we can stop using air quotes when we use the word upstander. Um, 
So this pedagogy that we use, this scope and sequence that looks at identity history and choosing to participate, um, I think the emphasis in all of that is that last piece, right? How am I going to act in the world because of this history that I've, that I've uh, come to learn and the insights I've, I've gotten from myself? I want to give you a small example um, from our newly revised resource called Holocaust and Human Behavior. Uh, it's now available online. Do you mind passing this out? Um, it's a mammoth work. It's 700 pages in print. Uh, teachers can easily move from the printed uh, copy online, of course, uh, to one of more than 65 videos that we created, um, 20 testimonies, video testimonies from survivors that uh, were curated in association with some of our partners at the Shoah Foundation and others. So what I, what I have for you here is a short reading from the uh, chapter, chapter 11, called The Holocaust as a Call to Conscience. And what I'd like you to do is um, spend the time to read this. It, it won't take you long. And I want you to try to find in it three things. Find something that surprises you in this text. Find something that delights you, that really makes you happy. Right? And then find something you want to ask a question about. All right, so let's have you do that. We're just going to take a minute or two to have you do this reading, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Okay? All right, so let's come back together, and let's, let me just ask, uh, what did you find surprising? Anything? Who's, who wants to go first? Surprising is how we have evolved to learn and understand and still have not been able to come to grips with making adequate advances. Yeah. So I'm just going to repeat that for the, the camera. It's, it's how much we've learned on the one hand, and yet we still can't cope with, with the world around us, right? Yeah. Things haven't changed. Think, right, things. That's what happened time of the Holocaust, and it's daily ongoing, not just at the national or international levels, within families. Right. <coughs> Great. Yes? The two points struck me here, um, one being that the gentleman who was on the Nuremberg trial, <laughs> Ben Ferenc, right, he saw living history. Right. And I believe that's what so many of the students today do not see. They hear it on TV, but until you go through the Holocaust Museum, or through a concentration camp, or through a Jewish museum in, say, Berlin, uh, you don't get the feeling. The feeling you get from going to some place where it happened is so much different than walking in, in sitting down and watching a film. The other thing is that in history, they say history constantly repeats itself. And yet we say we learn from history. But do we learn from history? And the problem is that so much of what happens, you cannot solve because it involves ethnic cleansing, because one group hates another group. It's a power struggle or as Hitler says, if you tell a lie long enough and, and more and more, people will believe it. And people get to the point where they accept what they're hearing without making independent judgments. So there are these root causes of some of this uh, strife. And we don't tend to look at those because our eyes are, are kept away from that by the, the shiny object that we're being shown. Right. So we, we, we don't look at, as you said, ethnic cleansing or the deep hatred of one group for another that may be caused by religion or whatever. And instead, we're looking at something else. We're looking at something superficial. The, um, remember I, I mentioned that study trip that a group of 40 professors took to Poland um, at the beginning of the Summer Institute on the Holocaust and, and Jewish civilization? 
The reason I think that study trip was so critical as launching that whole educational endeavor was without being in the place, it's really difficult to fully understand what happened. That's the, that is the task of the historian today, right, is to help students fully understand history despite the fact that you can't just go back there. Um, and that's, to me, that's part of the reason that um, our organization is very concerned that the survivor generation is going away. One of the things we've often done, we work very closely with is survivors and helping them get into high school classrooms. As that generation goes away, right, we're, we're working already on what we're calling the second gen and the third gen um, strategies of how do you get the children of survivors who heard the stories and can talk authentically about what they know so that history is not something that they that students don't experience, but something that they can hear the stories of an experience. Furthermore, to take say school children or even young adults through Auschwitz or Birch's Garden and have them see <coughs> the living conditions and have them experience, I mean, the stables in the holes. I think your, your point that, that living it or seeing history is different from just sort of raw academic study. Who else, something that you found in here that you thought, wow, I feel better now. Anything? Anything delighting in this, in this text? Somebody else did the word? Go ahead. Well, I feel better about being here. And uh, I'd like to uh, offer to people who are interested I was born in 1939 in Salonika, Greece, and I was three, four years old at the time the Nazis invaded. My family, including my father and mother, my father's parents, and I, went into hiding. And uh, we survived in hiding thanks to courageous Greeks, where we managed to live in many places. And so that shaped who I came to be. Absolutely. And so, uh, if anybody would like to engage learning more, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you. Or yeah. have meetings. So, that, that touches with the point about living history, right? Yeah. But it also touches on this idea that uh, at the very end of this text, that, you know, Ben Ferenc looks at students and asks, What are you doing, right? What are, what are you doing? So, someone took action at a point and rescue your family, right, to let them. Sure. And, and so we're telling students, you know, there, there's a good example. There's a choice that was made. Look at what it did, right? So, yeah, Steve. I'd like to come in heresy, if you don't mind. OK. OK. I really believe there's a widespread naivete about the value of words in teaching. I was supposed to be a filmmaker. My life took a different turn. Um, I found I was giving talks on peace, on, on peace Week at a high school, what really reached them, and they couldn't go to these places, but the videos, documentaries, you can come much closer to giving people a sense of what's going on through film than you can in just with written text. Yeah. Because seeing is usually believing. Right, and it moves you from the world you're in it puts you into a different frame. It, it goes back to this issue of living history, right? Because yep. now you're in a framework of the, the storyteller, and if the storyteller is doing a good job, you get pulled into the story. Yes. Right? Yes. Good. Yes, sir. One reaction I had to this is I remember reading in the past that <coughs> I think <coughs> Bill Clinton sent um, one of the first things he did regarding the uh, problems in Serbia. Um, is he sent planes to bomb uh, Serbian positions. And he was um, roundly criticized for that on two levels. One, because I think he was fighting charges, uh, scandals. And people uh, had assumed that he had done this to try to um, get out of, to turn some attention from his, his problems. Um, and also he was criticized because um, people wanted Europeans who were right there <coughs> to try to solve the problems, and it was criticism that was an Ameri typical American right. response. But I had, read, I had read that he had done that out of an honest, moral um, 
feeling that what was happening was was awful, and it's and it's, so it's interesting to me. I had not known that. Um, I, I don't actually how to pronounce his name, but Ali Luzel, Luzel yeah. um, had um, very directly um, spoken to him to to try to do something, and it makes me think, well, well that 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 could have been a part of his moral decision. I, I think I think so, and and again. Here is someone now. Wiesel is uh, a figure, you know, that has the kind of position in history, kind of gravitas to be able to say to a president, "You need to act." But that doesn't—that's no different from the, the the position every one of us has in the room, looking at at other kinds of, of things and saying, y "You have to act. You can't. You can't just stop here, right?" This is a moment to to. To use my the phrase I used before, to be an upstander and not just let something happen and go by. So yeah, and, uh, Wiesel can act on a kind of a national, international level. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, sort of bring us to a conclusion. I, I want to go to the very end of this text and to Ben Ferenz. Um, the uh, Ben is Ben Ferenz was the is the Nuremberg prosecutor here and. I just want to read this out loud because I think it's so important. Um, so he reaches as his 90s. Um, Ferenc finds, feels greater urgency than ever to create global institutions to prevent war. He wants young people to join the movement. And just I want you to listen to his voice. The question for you is where do you stand? Where do you stand? Do you stand for a world as we have it? A realistic world with the killing, the rapes, and the murders? If you do, then what are you doing here? Go home. If you believe it's possible to have a more humane world where we fight what we were fighting for in Nuremberg and what I'm still fighting for, then you've got to join the fight. Everyone can do something. Write a letter to the president. Call him up. Talk to your neighbor. Talk to your friends. Talk to your enemies. Do whatever you can. That's what I'm trying to do. We had a a point here about video and the power of video. We have a video screen. It's the best thing. So let me just give you the power of video here for a second. Meet Ben Ferenc. Let me tell you a story. Tico Brahe was an astronomer who felt that he wanted to find out the meaning of the universe. So he persuaded the king in power that he should build him an astronomical laboratory on the island of Ben. And there he built his observatory. And every night he went out and he viewed the stars and he put them down in a chart. And he had done that for about 25 years. A new king came on the throne and he said, look, we've got something going on there near El So the Treasury people came out and they said, old man, wake up, wake up. The king wants to know what you've been doing here these last 25 years. Oh, he said, I've been watching the skies. Watching the skies? Uh, what for? He said, well, I make a chart and I have 97 volumes exact. Each one I've measured myself and I can tell you the movement of every one of those stars. Well, what's the use of it? What do you intend to do with that? He said, I hope to live to get a hundred. A hundred volumes of the same thing? What, what's the utility? What, what can you do with that? Well, he said, I admit that I was trying to find out the meaning of the universe, and I haven't found it yet. But I believe that someday, somebody will, and I will have saved that person 25 years of labor. And when the American astronauts landed on the moon, they had with them the tables of Tycho. So there it is. It's an inspirational story, the watcher of the sky. I am watching the sky. That's it. Ben Ferenc has spent his entire life on a single problem, right? How to bring more justice into the world. 
Um, I can't think of a, of a better way of, of asking someone, right, so what? You saw these things when you were young, so what? You did this. Uh, I opened my talk today with thoughts about a Talmud scholar, David Weiss Halivni. Um, I want to conclude the same way. This is a different Talmud scholar. His name is Rabbi Tarfan, lived in uh, the year, maybe the year 135 or so. And he has a famous saying, uh, it's not incumbent upon you to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. And to me, that is the story of Tycho Brahe. It's the story of Ben Ferenz. It's the story, in fact, of all of us who have inherited the complex history of the 20th and 21st century. I'm very thankful to all of you for, for listening, and I'd be happy, really happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have a question. I think one of the things that Eisenhower did after the liberation of the concentration camps that was so right on the mark was to parade the German citizenry of all the surrounding areas through those camps so they could not deny that it didn't happen. And, you know, that I think. If you go to Germany, and I have been to Berlin and seen the memorial um, the museums, it seems that the German culture has changed so they recognize it and never want it to happen again. You know, if you go uh, to uh, Germany, to Poland, you go to any of the places where uh, the Holocaust was really enacted, and you look around, you'll see there are monuments everywhere. You'll be walking through uh, Warsaw, and there are small little stone stele that are just set up, and this is what happened here. This is what happened there. And it, it, it's, it's part of the way that uh, I think an entire uh, set of nations are dealing with their complex history. Um, that, that question about how do you memorialize, memorialize is really important because it, it's memory, right? How do you memorialize this? I think critical. Um, I, I think we don't do enough in this country, for example. We make grand monuments, but not small monuments. And I think those small, granular monuments really make a difference. Harry, you had a question before. I wondered what the scope of your outreach is uh, annually. I mean, how many stu students do you reach? How many yeah. uh, people overall? So <laughs> right now, we reach about 55,000 teachers in our active network. Uh, and you know, it's, it's more difficult to count students than teachers, but let's just say that most teachers interact over the course of a year with 100 students. That, if, if that's right, I mean, that's like five and a half million students. I, I, I'm more comfortable thinking about the number of teachers we have. Um, we have an ambitious goal over the next five years to scale our impact. We'd like to be at 200,000 teachers five years from now. There are about 250,000 teachers of high school social studies. There's about 300,000 teachers of high school English language arts. Um, we'd like to have a much larger percentage of them than we have now. But, uh, you know, it's a pretty, it nonetheless is a, a, an amazing reach. Um, it's doubled in the last five years, right? Five years ago, we were at half of that, so. And how are you funded? How are we funded? We're funded, um, we have a small endowment, which, uh, God bless the people who, who funded us. We have the most dedicated um, philanthropists, both institutionally, so some, some foundations, and individuals uh, who have funded us. We have a small amount of, of fee-for-service work, but for the most part, we're funded by philanthropy. And um, thank, you know, thank every person who's been generous in the past. Any one of you that wants to be generous, go to facinghistory.org. <laughs> We'd, be, we'd love to, to see you click on the donate button, but um, it's, it's really been generosity. There's a question here. Yeah. Um, something I think about when reading curriculum is, is does it reduce or increase the emotional distance or positionality of the student to the event itself? And I think one of the critiques of curriculum on the Holocaust is that the U.S. is cast as like the emancipator, the writer of wrongs through the Nuremberg trials, where sometimes ignoring like 
similar themes but drastically different events in the U.S. at the same time, like Japanese internment. Um, so how does this curriculum speak, that the larger volume of it, speak to sort of a more um, like inward looking, inward looking critique of U.S. society at that time as well? So one of the things I really am proud of in this new version of Holocaust and Human Behavior, which is online, you can, you can find it easily by going to our website. One of the things I'm really proud of is that it doesn't shy away from the difficult questions of where was the U.S. at this time? What, what did we do in the events? It also, so that's one piece of, of what you're talking about. The other piece is that it also links to our other resources that talk about other moments in history. So for example, um, the cultural genocide that was worked out that, that has now been admitted by the Canadian government, but there are other governments that have, cr that have committed cultural genocide. Um, uh, that, that's a, that's a, a resource that we have um, and it's linked in, into uh, the Holocaust and Human Behavior resource. So that a student who's saying, well, wait a minute, I, I've heard about these other genocides that have happened or other mass murders, some of which may have happened in my own backyard, my own, you know, my own, how do I get a purchase on those? And there are links that take them to these other resources for that. So um, I, I completely concur that if, if a curriculum distances a student from the history, instead of bringing them into closer connection with the history, um, that's a bad thing. We want, them, we, want, we want students in there feeling it, right? Yeah. Anything else? Could you explain that uh, last remark about Canadian uh, genocide? Yeah, so the, there was a, a practice in, in Canada of setting up residential schools and they, they, at a certain point, went around Canada, took the children out of homes of the native, uh, that is the first peoples, the first tribes, brought them to these residential uh, schools and forbid them, for example, to speak their original languages. What were the dates of this? Uh, well, some of the survivors of this are still alive. So it starts in the 1800s and goes uh, late 18 and goes right through the 1930s and 40s. Um, the residential schools, there's a, we have a great resource on this, but uh, there's been a fight in Canada for years about whether or not this was a cultural genocide. Raphael Lemkin's original literature on the um, on genocide included a category called cultural genocide. And when the UN voted the genocide uh, conventions, they left that out because they thought that it was going to be indicting too many nations. So uh, the Canadian government just about a year ago issued its own statement that they believed that they had committed cultural genocide and were apologizing for it. So that's, that's what I'm referring to. Did the US ever apologize for doing the same thing? No. Not that I know. But we did but the same thing happened in the US. Well, thank you very much. The witching hour has come. It's time. There's there's food and the like. Harriet, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm glad to have taken your questions. Thank you.